Hi, good morning. My name is Carl. I work for Noblis. Um, in my day job, I work for Ken, who's just up here on the, uh, on the stage. Uh, some of those dots that were on Finch's map, uh, some of the projects that we're trying to help to not just be dots on the map, but to actually connect to each other uh, and, and work as a system. Um, another part of my job, I'm lucky to be part of uh, our, our Noblest internal R&D team. And together uh, with some of our uh, other folks, drawn from across all the mission areas uh, that Noble supports, civilian and non-civilian, doing some very interesting things in, um, in orchestrated autonomy that I'd like to talk about today for a few minutes. Uh, and then I promise we'll get to the, to the robots over there uh, during the break. Okay, so I wanna talk just briefly about what our concept of orchestrated autonomy is uh, and why it's built primarily on a foundation of earned trust self-organized earn trust among those machines. Okay, humans learn to trust each other uh, in a very interesting way that machines don't directly replicate. Uh, machines learn an analog of trust that is based on the precision and the accuracy of the information exchanged between them. So that as a collection of machines, they can execute more and more complex maneuvers and take on more and more, and more complex tasks. When those machines are unfamiliar, heterogeneous, it's a tough problem, right? Because just like you might not lend a million dollars to the to someone you just met, you're maybe unlikely to lend a million dollars to someone you know for a long time, but at least you have something to base it on, right? So again, it's an analog, but machines have to develop the same kind of trust analog to work effectively as a team. Sometimes those teams are like pick up basketball. You don't always get to come to an intersection, to a dogfight, <laughs> to any kind of mission with a team that you pick. Sometimes you have to play with a team that shows up and they may or may not be trusted. Okay, so real quick. So in a general sort of IoT perspective, let's just consider a fundamental role of machines uh, communicating with each other within a, within a proximity boundary. This little blue circle down here is a role where we're broadcasting information. So one machine sending out information, who it is, uh, where it is, what it intends to do, what it senses. Those are the kinds of things it would generally share. And then other machines in the area pick up that information and use it. That's what the red squares are. And then other uh, machines in the area can also verify potentially that that information is accurate. Because remember, this is not a system in which trust is inherent. This is a system in which trust must be earned. So if these machines are gonna perform maneuvers or work on something together, they'll want to know how trustworthy is that information coming from B. So that's what this particular user, who might be a vehicle considering a particular uh, motion or another rover on next terrestrial surface trying to think about whether or not they can actually do something with or without that ro uh, additional rover. And there may be other machines in the area or infrastructure that can verify some or all the information being passed by the initial broadcaster. So what we would prefer if we had our druthers is that the users could find out, well, what is the trust? How much can I trust B? Not just potentially from the concurrent reporting from the verifier there, but over time. I mean, if I'm driving two centimeters away from you in traffic, I'm very interested in what you just did in the last four seconds. Believe me, I'm very interested. But I'm also, if we're gonna conduct a more complex maneuver, I'm also interested in what your track record is over the last 10 years of driving, right? The machines have the same requirement. So our concept for building our trust relies on a blockchain solution to be the thing, the thing, that collects, integrates, and provides these trust reports and inserts them into our machine, uh, our collective uh, set of machines that need it to maneuver, coordinate with each other, even if they don't uh, have a lot of established trust uh, from previous encounters, right? If I carry my reputation with me, then we can maneuver closely. If you come to me with a reputation that is poor, just like a student driver, if I see a student driver sticker on your car, I'm gonna back way away, right? I'm not gonna do anything dangerous around you, right? So if we can operate, the machines can operate in the system, understanding what the, how much they can trust each other, they can do much better. Now, why do we use a blockchain? Well, the blockchain, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, essentially it's a very clever distributed ledger that everybody can look at, it's an encoded. And if you mess with it, if you try to falsify it, uh, 
there, the, the, it, it actually identifies that the whole thing has been messed up. And since there are multiple copies of it, everybody's working from the same copy. It's a mutable record. When a lot of blockchains are implemented correctly, it's a, it's a distributed letter, ledger information that everybody can trust. And so remember we talked about how important trust is for automation, trust is for autonomy scale. Well, the blockchain, we feel, plays a critical role because it can be the keeper of that trust, right? Not like a one third party Equifax solution, which is problematic, but a set of distributed ledgers with as many eyeballs on it as possible to make sure that that information is correct. Now, so in this case, just to give you an idea from the picture, the trust reports uh, are accumulation of accuracy reports by other uh, machines in the vicinity of a different machine. And that all is encoded uh, in a comp competitive way among this consortium of blockchain miners that put all these transactions onto a distributed ledger. We'll see this in action in a, in a minute, but that's generally the idea, is that the blockchain essentially is the thing that delivers a trustworthy, reliable report into the collective set of unfamiliar machines. There it is. And because that's a transaction and it generates value, it is a way to make this uh, self-reinforcing as well as being self-sustaining from a financial standpoint. Okay, so one easy uh, to digest use case relates to a bunch of vehicles at, at an intersection where there's no marking. <laughs> uh, well, who should go first? Uh, in such a situation, if the machines were allowed to communicate their intent they could negotiate uh, who got to go where. And the more, uh, for example, uh, one of the questions here is, well, I could do one or two things, right? So the more flexibility in the message can allow the machines to identify uh, paths that are very interesting, useful, and efficient that may not necessarily align with uh, like standard hierarchical ways of dealing with uh, ac acquisition of space. Uh, so in this case, they could come up with a relatively complex plan but the criticality is, all right, if we're going to do this maneuver simultaneously and not just like, you know, wait and follow traffic instructions, uh, like the, the, the rules that we have for humans, um, then we have to trust that those uh, maneuvers will be executed precisely like we just agreed to, right? So, because if, if we don't, then we don't have a system that works, right? If somebody violates the, the plan, then the plan is no good, right? So we only make plans commensurate with the level of trust that the collection of machines have with each other. And over time, as the machines become, prove themselves trustworthy, or in this case, prove themselves capable of moving in a precise way, in a reliable way, uh, and providing sensor information in a, in a consistent way, um, we can push that collection of machines to do more and more amazing things, going from student drivers to Blue Angels, for example, right? That's kind of the spectrum, right? But we have to get there. We can't start, we can't jump into the last space, right? We need to start in a space where we have to build collectively, earn trust over time. So through many repeated interactions, those machines that earn higher trust and do not disrupt the collective plans, then they can uh, sign up and perform more and more uh, intricate maneuvers, more precise maneuvers, and faster maneuvers, okay? So, it sounds great. Wouldn't you like to see it in action? Okay, well, it's right over there. Okay, the, 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 little, <laughs> the little robot derby in the break, come on over and take a look at it. Exactly what I just talked about happens with these little 3D printed rotors with less than $500 worth of sensors on each one of them. Uh, you'll see them operate uh, in isolated autonomy where they do not communicate and they're super inefficient uh, because they can't anticipate what the other rovers are gonna do. When we connect them together with the pieces of eight system, they plan paths, they earn trust, they get faster and faster and faster. And those rovers that can perform more and more uh, intricate maneuvers earn higher trust scores. So if you got to stay here all afternoon by five o'clock, they would <laughs> they'd be, they'd be really fast, yeah. Uh, but in the short time we have, they're not gonna get that much faster, so I don't wanna sell uh, too much. But uh, in any case, the point is, that's what happens with these little rovers. But this is just one, one use case. Uh, what I would say is that 
rovers, our little rovers here, are just like any of the other multi-sensor platforms we talked about. Undersea, on the ground, drones, things in space, aircraft. Any of it, they, are there gonna be interactions between unfamiliar, heterogeneous things at different speeds, right? So the point is that they need to be able to collectively in an ad hoc way and in a self-organizing way get together, form a general idea together of what the obstacles are that they need to avoid within the space and then make a plan to maneuver around each other. And so the, ro the robot derby uh, is, a, is our way of showing how that uh, happens. And so I, I think during the break, if you have a chance, you can talk to me, you can talk to James or David or Drew or Thomas over there. We'll all give you more details on how that works uh, as part of the demonstration. Okay, um, so yeah, we think that's a pretty interesting idea. <laughs> we think the demo is pretty good. Um, we think it's pretty innovative. Uh, as far as we know, it's the, uh, one of the first uh, applications of blockchain for earned trust in the realm of autonomous systems. We feel like it's a critical way of making autonomous systems of systems work together well. Uh, what you'll see as part of a robot derby, in terms of the concept, it was something we worked on a little bit last year. We didn't get started trying to pull together a demonstration of it until October. We did a big sprint to be part of an international competition in January. We submitted the robot derby uh, as one of, the, uh, one of uh, more than 30 um, uh, entries regarding the use of blockchain uh, and orchestrated autonomy from across the world. Uh, it's sponsored by our friends at the um, Mobi Consortium, which is a consortium of automakers and uh, blockchain companies for the most part, looking for synergies around uh, that application. Uh, we were pleased and delighted to have won two, <laughs> two awards uh, there in, uh, in Munich at the BMW headquarters. Uh, Millie and I were there for that. Uh, we, did, we didn't know we were gonna win, so it was super exciting to go all that way and find out that we actually did win something. Uh, we won uh, an award for a hot, most creative solution and, and another award for the highest potential impact. Um, so, the, so if you get a chance, please stop by and uh, take a look at the, uh, at the Derby. Uh, it, it can be fun. It is totally unpredictable. They are super autonomous machines with minds of their own. They don't always behave. And so that's actually okay because we've built a system that is trying to teach them how to behave, right? So we're not trying to build the world's best $500 rover. That's kind of an interesting problem, but not the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to build the world's best collection of $500 rovers uh, that can do the most amazing things uh, collectively rather than on their own. All right, so the Robot Derby is cool. We love it. Um, but what does this mean really uh, for uh, autonomy at scale in general? So outside of the, uh, you know, the, the, the rover space over here, the rover play space. Um, so I think what's interesting about the blockchain application and this notion of trying to earn trust, so we don't try to do it all at once, uh, and that we try to allow the machines themselves to figure out how other machines can earn trust and build over time, right? in a whole variety of systems. So there's an adaptable system. We don't need a different set of rules for drones, a different set of rules for rovers, a different set of rules for cars. The same general principles of trust apply. So when these things work together, uh, at least on the rover side here, they're five to 10 times more efficient uh, than when they are in just pure isolated mode. Uh, one thing I'll say, like to, to Ken's point, in our world, if you're trying to get across the American Legion Bridge, we get about 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane across that bridge. With the current autonomous vehicles, which are generally pretty scared of crashing into stuff, that actually drops uh, compared to human drivers by 25%. So we're less, less efficient with pure automation right now with the technology in isolation. So what they're aiming for, I think, in many cases, to get the best of these autonomous vehicles, these automated vehicles, to drive like the best humans, which is great. And we might get you know 2,400 or so. What I can tell you with the little rovers, I think, and some of the back of the envelope calculations that I've done, I think we can quadruple the amount of throughput on the American Legion Bridge when trust is high, like this. If the automated vehicles have to distrust each other or treat each other as sort of alien objects like student drivers, we're never gonna get big transformative benefits in throughput. It's gonna, it's gonna, require, it's gonna require something like this uh, so that trust can actually be converted converted into capacity and capability. Last thing I'll say is another interesting byproduct of the tr trust earning, I haven't really talked about it at all, 
is that the machines that give way to the others, there's a micropayment also part of the cryptocurrency uh, token inside of the trust uh, equation that allocates equitably those who give way to those who have priority. So the machines that give way are compensated using cryptocurrency as part of this overall transaction. And the last thing I'll say is that if you, if one machine disrupts the plan, that machine is now liable and pays all the other machines for what was just like screwed up in those. Because if you break the plan, you're financially responsible for ensuring divert for that whole plan. You pay everybody off. Like, oops, sorry, my bad. And you have to hand out the crypto while everybody makes a new, a new plan. So self-reinforcing system, higher trust. It encourages uh, equity and best part of the system. And also, it encourages folks to get the most and best technology uh, engaged because when you're a high trust, high maneuver, high precision vehicle, you have to reserve less dynamic space. And when you are low trust, you have to buy more. So it's a little bit like dynamic pricing, like HOV. I don't know if you took 66 in how much you paid for it this morning, but that's a pretty gross, that's a big sledgehammery way of trying to manage demand. Our rovers buy space from each other at the one centimeter by one second, one square centimeter every second. That's how they negotiate for space. We don't do anything with them, they do it all themselves. And the price that they pay depends on the urgency of all the other machines around them. So the payments don't go to some you know, third party in the sky, you actually pay off the folks directly next to you. Okay. So with that, I think I'm gonna stop. I got about four minutes before I take a couple of questions. And then for the folks who are interested, I'm happy to go over and talk rovers all day. Questions? Yeah, hello. Thanks, uh, Larry Pryor with the Carlisle Group. Um, we, we've gone through decades of uh, CDMA versus TDMA GSM. Um, we, we've seen you know, wh what color of XML, all of the, the kind of wars around 802.11. So how do you get uh, heterogeneous systems to buy in, uh, especially when uh, all of the autonomous vehicles have capital inflow unprecedented in, in our history as, as, as a world? Yeah, we got right on. So that, that's, that's, that's a great point. So pieces of eight is a terrific concept, but it requires a network of effects uh, to, solu to solution, right? So. One of the things I think it's interesting, but I don't know if it's a perfect solution, but here's my, here's my counter argument, right? So my counter argument is that I can put uh, you in charge of a teleoperator rover over there when these guys are at high orchestration and you are gonna have a very difficult time moving in the system because you are not part of the plan. You can't see the plan being made. You can't anticipate what's going on. So there's a incentive to join. You can set up to join because being outside the system means that you're sort of locked out. You, you don't get to see what the other paths are unless you're communicating. Now, you gotta be, you gotta reach that state where there's enough of those vehicles there. You need a tipping point. Yeah, that's right, you need a tipping point. So, I'm not sure I have a perfect solution yet, but what I can say is that, uh, just like when you're at the bottom of an on-ramp and all the vehicles are going by pretty quick and you, you can't see the gap, you can't get in, that would be the sort of, if you're outside the system, either, either human or automated, that would be the sensation of being in such a system uh, once it actually gets to the tipping point. I don't know that we've solved the how do we get to the tipping point or where that tipping point is for the use case, but I do feel like it's worth taking a stab because of the inherent value of such a system. Any other questions? No? Then let's have a break and feel free to check out the robots. <laughs>